Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh. Oh, can you hear me? Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, welcome back from a, a power lunch. I believe each and every one of us enjoyed the lunch. Um, as chair of the session, allow me to invite you to this uh, session, uh, which is quite topical and timely. And we are privileged to be given this room because of the number of people who showed interest uh, to come in and, and, and listen to uh, speakers and also take part in the discussions uh, on the topic uh, we, we have. I'm Esther Dugumaro, as you can see. I'm the principal of Mpwawa University College in Tanzania. And this college is a constituent college of the University of Dar es Salaam. And, uh, here in this room, we have four um, prominent good speakers. I'm sure you have read their bios uh, in the um, documents that we've been given, but also in the website. And they have been kind enough to put up their presentations and they are ready to share with us their thoughts, their expertise, and also experiences uh on the topic that we have which is responding to local needs in a globalized world and specifically we are going to hear from them whether in the cause of responding to the you know local needs uh are we being compatible with uh, what is going on in the global world or are we having uh competing objectives so without further ado i would uh take this opportunity to kindly welcome Mariette, who is the Vice Chancellor of New York University in Abu Dhabi. And um, Mariette, you have uh, 12 minutes maximum. Um, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much. Yep, I just have one slide. Yep. No, why don't you not worry about it? Let's, can you put back where, what we are? Because this is a different session. Why don't you just leave? Yeah, let's just not worry about it. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much, Esther, for queuing us up. And thank you all for being here. It is our job in the post-lunch moment to keep you all excited, awake, and ready uh, to keep going through the day. I am going to do the, a very unusual thing for an art historian. I'm a historian of art. And so normally I am glued to my slides because you show art while you talk about it. And I think that the topic of our conversation today is so important that I actually would prefer to focus on the words we share with each other. I have slides which I will share with the uh, organizers and they will be on the website, but I don't think you really need them to follow what I'm going to say. I would enter this conversation by saying we appear to live in a deglobalizing moment. We are seeing resurgent nationalisms and fresh regionalization of economies, just when we should be pulling together across borders to tackle humanity's shared global problems. And all of us universities are feeling that heat. Governments, our governments are calling on us to focus on the needs of national citizens and national economies, industries, and especially in the case of technology, national security and defense. Now, this kind of call from governments has always been there. And I think it is reasonable for countries to expect their universities to develop local talent and, and to produce research that has national benefit. Fair enough. But this call in recent years has become louder and more insistent. And I think that this call and focus now threatens the cosmopolitan character of universities. Because after all, our universities, as we've already heard today, thrive on traveling scholars and students 
and have long dependent on the dependent on the free exchange of ideas across borders, regardless of na nationality. Knowledge seeking is no more local than climate change or a maddeningly infectious virus. It crosses borders. So all of our universities have a great stake in how the dynamics of this emerging world order is go are going to play out. Though I want to say parenthetically that order, world order, seems the wrong word for this seemingly permanent uncertainty that we are in and that lies ahead. But there, I think there is hope because the evidence, this e the evidence of a rampant new localism is still ambiguous, I think. And there may even be opportunity in it for our universities. I'll explain what I mean. If you look at the worldwide opening of opening up of travel the last three decades that also allows con conferences like this. And if you look at the marvels of the internet and social media, there is no question that the world is still more connected than it ever was. If you look at the devastating effects of the pandemic, the climate crisis, or the war in Ukraine, there's also no question that much local trouble is global trouble. If you look at the nationalism and xenophobia that is now shaping so many national policies, there is no question that borders are closing in ways we have not seen since World War II. And in economics, if you look at the way the pandemic showed up, the vulnerability of just-in-time just in time supply chains, the thing that Amazon got us all used to, we, show, we saw how vulnerable that idea was. If you look at that, there's no question that regionalized manufacturing, rather than ever freer trade, is our immediate future. And together with the inexorable march of global warming, these forces are now generating crises of inequality and of migration on scales not seen since World War II either. And inevitably, this is all bad news, inevitably these conditions affect our universities large or small, public or private, it doesn't matter. In our era, any little pebble that causes a global ripple will impact local environments, often at the speed of TikTok. I hope you know TikTok. Our young people are all on TikTok. Twitter not so, tw Twitter not so much anymore. So this means no small problems, but it also means no small opportunities for the types of universities represented in IAU. While our governments and all these businesses are struggling to adjust to the new geopolitical realities, universities have a vitally important role to play in educating citizens, as well as stateless people from all over the world. We need to strengthen, not attenuate, our research across borders so we can bring solutions. And also, and I think this is important, shine a bright light on the good things, the productive things that humans can do when they get together and put their bright minds to it. So we must find the global in the local. And if we get that right, we may even reduce our carbon footprints too. Now at my institution, New York University Abu Dhabi, we feel this heightened sense of mission these days. And I think our experience, we're a young institution, but our experience may be instructive for this very conversation about the local and the global. And I say that because we were designed to be global and local, local and global in an incredibly intentional way. This is what my slides are about, but I didn't want to just do, put on a puff piece for my university so you can see them online. I'll just tell you about my university for a moment. So NYU Abu Dhabi opened in 2010, 12 years ago. And in the three years leading up to that moment of opening, I was the first provost sent out by NYU to help design and create this brand new university. I will say that being, the, being a provost without a university is the best academic job on earth. You can say yes all the time, not no, just build, build, build. And what we built in those three years and in the 12 years since, 
is the offspring of a full partnership between NYU and the government of Abu Dhabi, the capital of the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. NYU AD was envisioned to be a resolutely international university, but one that would be in and off Abu Dhabi and the UAE, in and off NYU, and in and off the world. Indeed, it would be for the world. We opened in 2010 to 140 students, a tiny little class, and they came from 35 countries. Only 5% were local. Only 5% were Emirati citizens. Today, 12 years later, we are at 2,100 undergraduates and 125 graduate students from about 120 countries. And 22% of our students are Emirati citizens. By design, we don't have a majority nationality, ethnicity, language, or faith by design. We are a liberal arts and research university that is both deeply grounded in Abu Dhabi and fueled by the global American university that is NYU with its 55,000 students and 8,000 faculty around the world. Now, what's interesting is that NYU is a private university, but in the UAE, because of our wonderful partnership with Abu Dhabi, we almost function as a public anchor university. But with all the benefits of being a private institution that has roots in the global urbanity of New York City, you can imagine some of the tensions and interesting dynamics that emerge there. Our undergraduate curriculum is global and interdisciplinary, and it's propelled by dialogue and intercultural learning among all these students and faculty. We have a core curriculum that offers great breadth and helps students apply their learning in the world. They take their learning into the world. So for example, our first year writing seminars aren't just about composition and syntax. They make students go into the UAE to encounter that society they've come to to study. And it is one of our favorite courses. And I don't know that I know many universities where required writing is a favorite course. It's because they get to interact in the community. And then, of course, they take majors across all disciplines from science and engineering to the arts, humanities, and social sciences. And in these majors, we induct the students into research, but we also push them to apply their discipli disciplinary learning to do good, to do good at home and abroad. Our engineering students, for example, take a required course called Engineering for Social Impact engineering for social impact. And they follow that up with projects in communities that are helpful at home and abroad. I can go on and on about our university, but I only have two minutes left. So I'm going to go fast and you can ask me more, but I'm not going to speak faster. I'm just going to say a few things. You can see a lot on our slides. An important outcome I want to talk about is that 96% of our students have jobs, road scholarships or Yenching scholarships or great graduate placements within a few months of graduating. So they do very well in the marketplace of employability particularly, and more than 50% of our students from abroad, in fact, stay in the UAE. They're attracted there, they work there, they help build the knowledge economy. Now, we have a lot of resources there and we're young and this is a great benefit. We have a lot of resources for students. Not every university does, I recognize that. But these are the four lessons I see in our youthful experiment with global education in a local setting. And our students, by the way, also get to study abroad in NYU's other sites from New York to Shanghai to Sydney. Here are the four things. First, a global experience can be found not only by going abroad, but it can be had by having students from different countries and backgrounds live and study together. Many of those students for any of your universities are already in your country. Immigration is after all, almost everywhere. Second, with an intentional pro program of community engaged learning, community engaged learning, if you're intentional about it, you can offer the global and find it in your local environment by going into communities. 
and to make sure that Emu Abu Dhabi does that right, both its local and its global mission, we put global education and community-based learning under one umbrella led by a very seasoned and creative administrator, the remarkable Carol Brandt, who sits both on my vice chancellor's leadership team, but also our provost leadership team. So that's an administrative move you can make that makes people connect to the global and the local. And then third, and this will be so obvious to you, none of this can happen if faculty don't see the point of it. They need to see the benefits of this local activity for their sense of themselves as educators and researchers. And they sometimes bristle a little bit at the idea that research should have local relevance. Fair enough. And that's the final point. That's the final point. It's about faculty interest in research. That's after all curiosity driven. What we are finding now in this final point is that more and more the global in our university offer is also local. When it comes to UAE priorities like peaceful coexistence, public health, the energy transition and fighting climate change, our goals are actually quite closely aligned. And they're the same goals that our students want and they're the same goals that our faculty want. So it is indeed possible to find, I think, these alignments. It's not easy, but we will need to do it to justify our existence uh, in, the, in the future, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mariette, for a very good uh, presentation, which uh, surely you managed to keep all of us awake, if, especially having come from a power lunch. Um, may I now take this opportunity to welcome Peter Andre, who is the president of the German Rectors Conference in Germany. Uh, the floor is yours, Peter, and you have 12 minutes. Um, I was very kind to the lady. I'm not sure whether I can be kind enough to you. So please observe time. Thank you. Okay, fine. Thank you very much, Adi. Thank you for uh, the friendly introduction. I would like to um, share some thoughts on a motto you all know very well, Think Global, Act Local. It's attributed to Patrick Gaddis, who has been a Scots town planner and social activist. And uh, he has said in 1915, I quote, Local character is no mere accidental old world quaintness. It is attained only in cause of adequate grasp and treatment of the whole environment and an active sympathy with the essential and characteristic life of the place concerned." Unquote. Now this motto is used in different uh, constellations, particularly in an environmental context. For instance, when we say we must consider the health of the entire planet while taking action locally. I try to depart from my personal and institutional background from the situation of uh, German universities in order to tackle this motto and to identify its potential for our comprehensive question. German universities are well networked in their local and regional surroundings. This is key to them and they are in permanent dialogue with all groups and society there. The universities render different services massive importance for the society's scientific, economic, and cultural development. And this is also um, a performance um, which is delivered by the so-called rare disciplines, which massively contribute to this um, connected knowledge, which is very important to the regional role universities play. Um, transfer and cooperation with society uh, are basing on uh, the university's core missions in research and teaching. They are no add-on. 
they are a part of their mission. For instance, uh, when it comes to community engagement and service, or when it comes to dialogue and collaboration with business and industry employers, all these activities being part of the third mission of universities are rooted in what they're doing in research and teaching. Um, what are the to-dos derived from that? First of all, I think it's very important to integrate service learning and other projects with societal stakeholders into our curricula, into the syllabus of instruction, in order to promote students' active social engagement beyond the expertise um, they want to achieve during their study time. And this also includes that we have to incorporate societal access issues and perspectives into research, and that we have to invite potential stakeholders to engage. That is what citizen science as a part of open science is all about. Nevertheless, I think um, we must also clarify that the issue of independent research is crucial. Um, citizen science does not mean that everybody can try to feed in his personal or her personal interests. So the selection of research problems, of approaches and methods must be left to science itself. This also includes that we have to clearly communicate limits of researchers' understanding of worldwide problems. Science is not about religious truths. It's about an attitude, about openness, about curiosity, and this is what we have to communicate if we want to communicate science, not only to communicate results, but this open-minded attitude is a very important issue, I think. Communication with external stakeholders in the city and region does also include this obligation, I guess. This is the local dimension. The global one is not a contradiction. German universities, again, depart from that, maintain 38,000 partnerships with 5,900 partner institutions worldwide. Our point of view, the German Rectors Conference point of view, is um, that we must perceive ourselves as transnational actors. And this um, means um, that we are a part of the global higher education community. In recent years, international networking um, played um, an increasing role, um, particularly um, in regional and global dimensions. And I think uh, this has also massively boosted, and we all share this impression, by um, the means of digital communication and open science. Um, what we really need when it comes to internationalization is a strategy. We want to define what goals we want to um, pursue in the future, what we want to reach. Um, and we must also internationalize our curricula. Um, we must, last but not least, consider internationalization as a very, very important element of our research in teamwork conditions, but also with respect to the visibility of research with regard to diversity as a very important element, which is massively improving the standards of science and research. Universities um, need to have uh, staff which is enabled to set up all these goals. Um, we have to take care for human resources and support structures. And this is a twofold task. On the one hand, we need uh, people who are feeding in the strategy development and planning of internationalization. They are the science managers, a new intermediate category between science and administration, which has been playing an important role in the last decade. And in addition to that, we have also take care for staff, which is uh, more or less represent, uh, responsible for traditional operational services in the field of international student recruitment, marketing, and uh, alumni networking, and so on. This all um, desire, uh, requires um, an adequate uh, funding. Um, without this funding, we couldn't um, go for these goals, definitely. Um, are there um, any hints that acting locally and acting globally are really opposites. I think uh, that's not the case. That might be a supposed tension between these two local and regional and international anchorings. But in, in, in fact, I think um, we have to integrate both sides uh, if we want to really connect our universities, both to work and business, to local and international perspectives. And this uh, can uh, considered in different perspectives. Uh, first, in teaching and learning, 
Um, we all know that local knowledge is very important for the curricula, but we want to also um, produce well-rounded graduates um, who both study abroad and have their local experiences in service works and so on. Um, and in research and innovation, I think it's inevitable to have these both perspectives, the local grounded one and the global one. Um, without that innovation, it will not be possible. What we really need is an integrated vision and mission for universities in the core fields that they are responsible for. In educating, we want globally minded uh, graduates uh, with uh, local experience. We need language competence, which is key um, to an international engagement of universities. And uh, in research, I think it's definite Early the case um, that research can be a good uh, for society if it is connecting local and global engagement. The grand challenges uh, reveal that it's necessary to have those perspectives in mind when it comes to um, infectious diseases, when it comes to climate change, to migration, energy um, consumption. All these topics can only be tackled um, in a mixture between the local, uh, local. Um, basement, so to say, and uh, the global perspectives. And uh, one issue which is uh, of major importance for our experiences as uh, universities, I think, is uh, the potential tension um, between collaboration and competition. Uh, competition plays a key role in academia, particularly with respect to institutional settings, with regard to rankings, outcomes. Um, and uh, it's more important for institutions, I guess, than for the individuals. Um, but we all know uh, that beyond competition, um, the workflow in research and teaching is very much depending on teams, uh, on interaction and exchange, and this free flow of information, which is addressed by the issue of open science, is very important uh, in order to have real progress. For this reason, um, in addition to competition, we need collaboration and this artif artificial word of co-repetition might be describing adequately what we really look for and what we really need in um, science and research in a globalized world. So my bottom line is quite clear. Um, universities in the 21st century act and think both locally and globally. Unless they do this, uh, they won't be successful. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for keeping time. Um, I hope I didn't scare you off when I didn't promise to be so kind, but I would be. Um, it was a very interesting uh, presentation as well, and we are going to have time to engage in the conversation. So may I kindly request that you don't forget the questions based on uh, Peter and uh, Marietta's presentation. Now I have the honor to uh, present to you uh, Juan Rayon, who is the president of Erasmus Student Network in Belgium, to come and share with us his presentation. The floor is yours, Juan. Yes, I think you can hear me well. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here today. I'm Juan, the president of the Erasmus Student Network, and I'm going to try to answer this very difficult question about whether we can you know, make these two objectives compatible. My presentation is going to be about the role that student mobility, community engagement, and networks, networks not only of universities, but also students can have in answering this question. But first, I will start by introducing a bit my organization, the Erasmus Student Network. We are one of the main international student networks for now in Europe, but we are expanding. So we're trying to also get new contacts around the world. So maybe we can also discuss that later. And we work mainly in the fields of student mobility and internationalization. We are active in 41 countries. We have more than 500 local associations that are present in totally more than 1,000 higher education institutions. And we have around 15,000 volunteers that support 350,000 
do this every year. And we have three main pillars of our activity. So we are a very activity-based grassroots organization. We work on student support and student engagement. So trying to support international students on the ground through a difficult process of navigating the international experience and also fostering their engagement with the community, with the leadership, with their institutions. Then we also work on outreach and promotion, basically raising awareness about the importance of internationalization and making sure that the voices of students, of international students mainly, are represented. And last but not least, on reintegration, what happens after the mobility experience and how do we build on all that learning to, for the benefit of society. And our mission is, I believe, very important for the discussion that we're having today, the enrichment of society through international student mobility. And basically, what we believe is that for something that looks like a very individual activity, like student mobility, we should focus more on the societal dimension. How do we make sure that this really individualistic experience can become a positive uh, force for, for change and for good for all the community and not only for those students who participate? And that's why we believe in internationalism for us. We believe that these international activities, if implemented with a different approach, can bring benefits to the whole of society. We work a lot with data in ESM. We try to understand the student experience better. Um, I think that exchanges are more common in Europe than in other parts of the world, but all your universities work with student mobility. You try to attract new students. Many of you have exchange programs. And we all like student mobility. We have discussed already a couple of times in this conference the importance of student mobility. But the student mobility is not perfect yet. And one of the reasons why it's not perfect, even though, as we can see in the internationalization survey carried out by the International Union of Universities, it is the most famous international activity that universities do. It, it, we still struggle with implementing this kind of mobilities when it comes to the engagement between internationals and locals. All internationals, when they go abroad, they want to make friends from other countries, but the process does not always work that well. There is this invisible barrier many times between international students and their hosting communities. They do plan to make friends. That's always part of their plan, trying to engage with the community, but it doesn't always happen. Because many times what happens is that we take engagement for granted. We believe that even without trying to improve the process, students will become a natural part of the hosting communities. But what we see after so many years of gathering this data is that if there are no proper and established and systemic processes to ensure this engagement, it doesn't happen that often, or at least not always. You can see in these data points that less than half of the students, this is mainly in the European context, but even if it's quite applicable also to other regions of the world, do not really engage with local communities, with their hosting local communities in a systemic way. So they are not part of the community life by joining sport clubs, volunteering initiatives, music clubs. And this is fundamental to ensure that that internationalization I mentioned goes beyond the individuals and really has an impact on the community. But of course, I'm here also to bring positive news about the potential that student mobility and proper internationalization can have in the improvement of communities and on bringing internationalism for all. What we see is that there's a lot of potential in these mobilities because when it comes to the acquisition of interest and awareness on global topics, when students go abroad, they do gain relevant interest in, in some of the most pressing global topics, such as sustainability and climate change. I think you might not be able to see it, but if you look at there uh, I, on the bottom, the second one, climate change and human rights are the two topics in which students gain more interest when they are abroad. So even if they are not always doing these engagement initiatives, just by going abroad, they are already becoming more interested in some of the most important issues of our time. But of course, the problem is that if we don't use this potential to not only create the connections with the global topics, but also with the local ramifications of those issues, we are missing out in terms of the potential. We have untapped potential that we can use. Another fantastic thing in a time of global competition, your political uprising, is that from our data, we see that student mobility creates something really interesting. We hear all the time from populists all over the world and nationalists all over the world, that these globalist tendencies will destroy nations and cultures. But actually, we see quite the opposite. We see that internationalization can create multi-layer identities that are not competing with each other. When they go abroad, students develop a closer connection with their continent, with the world, in the case of Europe, with the European Union. But this can be applicable also 
to other continents to different uh, continental realities without losing any type of attachment to their nationalities or even to the regions and cities. So we can build on this potential to create true global citizens. So basically what we try to do, what we believe in the Erasmus Student Network is that interaction with local communities should be at the heart of the international experience. So not only a part of it, not only that it's a nice to have, but actually a must to have, something that we should always consider whenever we plan international activities. The best way to do that, community engagement activities, really trying to integrate activities that engage the community directly. The problem is that even if these activities exist, in some cases, we see them, we heard about service learning, we heard about different activities, many times they are not, in, they are not implemented with a systemic approach, really trying to change the structure of trees, of curricula sometimes, of how we integrate learning outcomes, so there is a real systemic impact. And of course, for that, the recognition dimension of the learning outcomes, it's fundamental. What we believe is that the next objective in this field should be the creation of educational frameworks that really integrate the learning outcomes of community engagement initiatives in the learning experience of students. And that this framework should not only work for students, but also with students. So the students should be a part of the process of the creation and the implementation of the framework. For that, we believe that community service learning can be a great solution. This is something that we have been implementing in ESN together with partners from all over Europe and hopefully soon also from all over the world, mainly through our social Erasmus initiative. A really easy name, Erasmus, for those who don't know it, is the main exchange program in the European Union, but also beyond. It's now a global program. I believe that many of you engage with the capacity building dimension. And what we have been trying to do for this social Erasmus Plus project it's to make this systemic change that I was telling you about, to think about how we can, first of all, create a program that can be implemented all over Europe, but also embedded in the international experiences of students, trying to create those interactions with local communities. We started many years ago, but it was in 2017 when we got the opportunity to implement it in a mass scale. And the numbers since then are quite impressive. Since we started with the project, we have organized more than almost 10,000 activities. The numbers need to be updated, but now it's more than 10,000 involving more than a half a million people. So that's quite a lot of people, always with this component of students, working with students and focusing on community impact. How does the process work? Well, the best thing about this process is that it involves all the actors on an equal footing basis. They all have a say on the creation of these initiatives. The student is at the center and the student is part of the whole process, but then student organizations, universities, and actors representing local communities also work together. And the great thing is that here, the university does not necessarily have a leading role in the implementation of the activities, but many times gives this leading role to student organizations that get the needed support that can be financial, logistical, educational, can be in terms of research capacity to implement these activities and ensure that they achieve a big impact. And the focus is on three pillars. First, meaningful benefit for local communities. So the biggest priority is to organize activities, to organize projects that match the needs of the local communities. Because if we focus on the impact of local communities, the learning experience of students will come. If the focus is on impact, learning, competence development for the students will always come. Second, the co-creation with the students and local actors. As I was saying at the beginning when my friend Sebastian also talked, this is about not speaking about the students without actually asking them and involving them. And we also believe that the students can have a role in the implementation of the program. Since Social Erasmus uh, or, or volunteers work directly with the community and they are the ones in the process many times. And um, finally, institutional support which is, as I said, about the recognition of learning outcomes, the connection with research projects, the continuity, and also the impact measure that can support the motivation of the students. Just to give you one of the best practical examples that we have of this initiative in Europe, which is the collaboration between our local association in Besançon and the University of French Comité. For years, this university and our ESN section there have been implementing this program in the Center of Applied Linguistics, in which every year a group of students, around 50 international students, engage on a semester-long project in which they participate in a number of activities that amount to 25 hours in total, three for activities per week during the semester, 
And there is a clear learning process that implies the preparation of the activities, the implementation, and then the reflection, also sharing the final results with the whole student community. The course is recognized, so students get ECTS at the end, and this goes to the Diploma Supplement, one of the Bologna tools that probably you already know about. And of course, the university has an academic responsible, there is an activity coordination. So as I showed before, all the actors have a clear role and they will collaborate together with the roles being clearly defined. Okay, sorry. So just to finalize, why are these networks so important? Why these initiatives that I'm describing should not be only about the local implementation. When we work in an isolated basis at the local level, we can achieve an impact, that's for sure. But when we work with networks, we can have the space for mutual learning in which processes that start in a university done by a group of students can become the norm, maybe across a continent or even across the world. Initiatives can be tested at the local level, and then if they work, there are clear channels to implement them in other parts of the world. And then we can also work the other way around, top down, creating a common direction that can increase the impact. So just to finalize the key points, remember to, whenever thinking about how to square this circle and achieve an impact, prioritize the benefits for the community and adapt these pressing global issues to the local context, uh, have the students and the representatives leading processes, involve the community actors in the design and implementation, put recognition at the center to reach beyond the usual suspects, and then promote the international dimension of local student activities through networks. That's it. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Juan, for another very good presentation. And I now have the honor to invite Edwin, who is our last speaker, before we engage in conversation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Edwin. All right. So um, I was planning to start my speech with uh, two what I thought would be quite controversial statements. But in a way, in other words, my previous speakers have actually already been hinting towards them. Um, and my thoughts are as follows. I don't think that serving the ne local needs should be a pillar or should be a goal of the university strategy. Even though I am a real true globalist, I actually think that it is the fundament on which the whole university and the whole university strategy should be built on. Uh, also, I think some speakers think will agree that local goals and local priorities do not always have to compete with global goals and global priorities. If they are focused and if they are aligned, actually, these goals can be quite synergetic and be, yeah, almost provide a reinforcing cycle, um, strengthening each other. So it's a great privilege to be here and explain to you where my, where my thoughts come from. Um, well, this is. But first, something about me and about study portals so that you understand the background of what I will be sharing with you. And this is well, me. I guess you recognize me when I'm still young. Um, studying in Japan. I'm a Dutch guy. I'm an industrial engineer. But I had the privilege of studying in many places, including uh, in Japan. And in this picture, you almost see whole of Pond's presentation coming back. Yeah, because you see here on the on the bottom right, you see my sensei, my professor, Ike sensei, um, with whom, we, and on the, on the left, we see um, my senpai, the senior student that was responsible for me. And together with the two of them, I did a local research in industrial engineering, which turned out to be quite an impactful research. And I believe with my different perspective and with my connection to the English world and with the with the knowledge that I brought back from my home institution, I was able to deliver a stronger research and also bring some of that back home to my own locality. We also see on the left, we see my host sister, she's Japanese. Um, 
so fun when you told about having a good program to integrate students in locality. That's something I can totally relate to because she really did made a whole difference for me to to integrate with the Japanese culture and understand the Jap the Japanese psyche, which was beyond actually the academic learning. What I did was on a personal level even much more impactful. And then there are also two friends here, two from two uh, ladies from Korea. Um, what you also see here is lifelong relationships being forged. And for me, very fundamental and transformational impact of education, what we're speaking about this conference, this is where my purpose was born, to help other students to also look for their education opportunities abroad. Um, and, and through that, I've been able to build a business it's only already in our local town again more employs more than 100 people the local impact but also on a global level has an impact that is much bigger than i could have ever imagined thanks to the partnerships of with with many of the universities here now that so that's been out of control quite a lot so study portals help students to find and compare other education options across the world and make an informed choice we work with over 4,000 universities in 118 countries will serve about 60 million students this year. So through that, we have a lot of data about what students are looking for, what students are choosing, what, what institutions are offering and how that is changing on a day by day, country by country, discipline by discipline basis. Um, we also uh, engage in, in research, uh, and this is a publication we did a while back uh, together with our advisory board and the many institutions uh, we partner with, we thought about education in the future, and that has a big relationship to what we're talking about in this session. Um, one, I think, always revealing stat is that 75% of the global STEM graduates, science, technology, engineering, and math, I think it is, um, will, be, will be coming from BRICS countries in 2030, 8%, only 8% in the US and only 4% in Europe. And so all the talent or the most, the, the most, let's say, scarce talent will be coming from those regions. We identified five archetypes. <laughs> so five models which universities can adapt or adopt to be sustainably successful. And you can divide them in two. The first two archetypes are for research intensive institutions that are themselves producing knowledge. So new knowledge and curriculum producing institutions. Um, and the, the, the three other ones are typically institutions that would consume curriculum and knowledge that is produced by the first two. But all have to, we have a slight different focus. There's club higher ed that it has a focus around student life, facilities, sports, and so on. There's the scalable digital university, which is very much about trying to bring more access to education by bringing down the cost of delivery and, 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 and building very scalable models of, uh, of higher education. And the, the fifth one is the professional learning institute, which really has a focus on career building, professional learning, um industry academic collaboration etc so these are the three but for the first two are for research intensive institutions now there will remain a place for let's say the elite comprehensive university but the number of universities that can be good at everything is going and still be sustainable is going to become smaller and smaller because of the increased global capital competition for resources and the extreme funding that is required to be able to sustain such an institution maybe in the netherlands where i'm from 10 years ago there could be three or four of those utrecht and amsterdam and leiden but most likely in the future there can only be one and even at some point the question is if the netherlands can have a ultra comprehensive institution all the other institutions will have to make choices now, what are what is very difficult for universities? Making choices, making choices super hard. But there is a sustainable model for 
um, the Nice Research Institute, where the university decides we want to be strong in a couple of disciplines. And this is where I think the fundament again of the local environment comes in. Typically, that is strongly supported if the niches that are chosen by the universities to be strong at are in line with the local, either local strengths of the industry, the local needs and problems that are existing in the locality of the institution, or for instance, the location, the nature, the environment of the institution. Because that creates synergy. Um, and this, like, and this is the, the synergetic and the kind of positive reinforcing spiral on how marrying and aligning local goals with global objectives can work. So if the institution makes choices that are in line with local strengths, um, that will drive the capability and also the credibility of the institution to be strong in those areas. And sometimes or often it's, it, it's more sustainable to be strong in a few than to be strong in many areas. That then in turn results in a bigger global advantage to attract talent and resources in those fields. Because of the credibility, because of the local relevance, it makes sense that talent uh, will flow to that reason, to that institution and resources as well. A good example. My alma mater in the Netherlands is the Eindhoven University of Technology. It's a good institution. It's not world famous, but in some areas, for instance, semiconductors, there is there's the biggest, the global, the world's biggest industry in creating the machines, the wafer stepper, the machines that produce microchips, is in the Eindhoven area, and therefore they have a very defendable position to be excellent in that field. And often for the talent that comes to the university, they don't come from the university. They come because they know of the regional strengths. And of course, the university works together a lot with industry to, to, to nurture this, but the pool of the distinguishing factors of the region is stronger than the university itself on these fields. And that then again turns into more IP, more innovation, and giving talent back to the locality. So that's the positive reinforcing spiral that, that, that we've seen operating at, uh, at those institutions, which can be a way how local and global objectives, if well aligned, uh, can support each other. Some data that supports that. So if we ask our students what is most important to them when choosing a study destination, and this is pretty recent data, the uh, employment options, two minutes, the employment options are one of the most important ones. Actually, they are number two most important for non-EU students and number three for EU students. Often even more important than tuition fee or rankings. So this is changing. If we ask our students how many of them are intending to work abroad or work in and or, or around the, the destination where they are going to study, on average we'd say about 60 to 65 percent says yes they're already determined to do so, to stay and work in the locality. Uh, and only 4% for European students and 7% for non-European students has made up their mind that they, that they are not interested in that. So career opportunities is becoming one of the most important uh, pool factors of uh, international talent attraction, which is good news for, again, for the locality. And these were the core, the core uh, of my argumentation. I look forward to the discussion. I look forward to hear from you what you are running into when you try to combine those local and global objectives and bring 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 them in alignment. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Edwin, for yet another good presentation. Now we have half an hour to engage, a little more than half an hour, about 35 minutes, to engage in a conversation. And I propose you react to uh, any of the presentations that we have heard from our good four speakers uh, in terms of questions or you know, point of clarification, and you try to be uh, focused. Uh, time is not really enough for this kind of uh, discussion and the topic at hand. So in order to do justice to all of us, let us stay focused when we are given an opportunity uh, to make a contribution. So to get the discussion started, allow me as your chair to mention a few things. First and foremost, I would like to once again, uh, thank all the, present the presenters for their good presentations. And as I said, we have to be focused. I have a lot to share, but I'm going to stay true to my word. So I'm going to be focused. Um, uh, Mariet and Peter, you know, to me, they gave us um, responses to the topic at hand from the university management point of view. They underscored the uh, core functions of the universities. They underscored the importance of uh, uh, internationalization. And they also um, mentioned various challenges that we face globally and also resources that we are competing for. And um, in their presentation, not only the, the first two, Marietta and Peter, but also one and Edwin, um, all the presentations actually to me concur that we need to act uh, locally, but we need to think globally because our actions have to be uh, well calculated so that they don't magnify global problems. And when I look at uh, um, one and Edwin, uh, we have listened to experiences from um, students network uh, leader of the student network, uh, where he brought us, you know, experiences from students' point of view. Again, internationalization and um, uh, engagement of local community has been underscored. But when we uh, go back to uh, Edwin's presentation as the co-founder of Student Portals, he too mentioned all of the importance of uh, internationalization and uh, student experiences. So those are the few from me out of the men I have, so I don't uh, abuse my portfolio and spend most of the time instead of uh, giving it to the audience to engage in discussion. So may I have hands and I propose to we take three uh, either questions or comments and then we uh, take another round as time allows us. Thank you for listening to me and uh, the floor now is yours. I see one hand there, and can can I see the second one? Or oh, we can? Oh, this, oh, there are two here. So let's take the first three, please. Oh, we start with the lady there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ying Sani, or you can call me Sonia. I'm from Siam University, Thailand. I can really relate with this conference, uh, the relevance and the value of the universities because I was a part of Erasmus uh, mobility program under the capacity building. And I had the chance to visit Mikolas Romeras University in Lithuania. I would like to say that from as a Thai citizen, frankly speaking, many students and many members and the uh, Friends, they don't know about Lithuania so much. So it's like a cultural exchange. And I've been to not only Nicholas Romeras University, but Vilnius University, and it's a very oldest university. And I shared these pictures with the students and the colleagues back home. And it was like very shocking and quite amazing for them from the cultural perspective from Asia, that Europe has a vast culture that really people don't explore. 
So I'm really thankful to Erasmus program and really thankful to this mobility program that Asian students can have this platform and can have this, uh, you can say, and a chance to visit Europe. And I think that Asia should also do something like that. Maybe the Asia University Network or maybe some other network can also do some exchange where European students can also come to Asia. That will be another, uh, you can say, a border to open up. And I'm really grateful to Yuan. I really like your presentation and I wish you can share me your slides. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we have the next comment or question, please. Thank you. Uh, my, my name is uh, Roberto Scalante and I am the Secretary General of the Association of Latin American and uh, European Universities. I, I think the topic that we have been, uh, we have heard, I mean, the presentations that we have heard from our speakers is a very, uh, how could I put it, it's, it's very attractive but at the same time, we have to be very careful. Uh, and I say so because, um, well, in principle, being in a global world or not, universities should be or must be very close to local needs. I mean, independently being in the global world or not. I mean, I, I, I think the main vocation of universities is to serve society and to serve uh, their surroundings and the communities they they are in, they, in which they live. In the global world, the, the, this equation becomes a bit more complicated. Um, when I some years ago. I was the Dean of the Faculty of Economics of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, that is well known. And I uh, encouraged students, I mean, to go abroad. And um, we, when they came back, when they came home, we got two reactions. Well, some were fascinated with what they, they saw and they lived, you know, and they said, that's exactly what we should do, you know? Others said, well, some of the things that I saw outside are useful, but some others don't have anything to do with what we need. And um, following something that somebody said in the first presentation, in the sense that knowledge is not neutral, we have to be careful that the knowledge that one acquires in a globalized world could be good sometimes locally or could be bad locally. And just give, uh, let me give you two examples. I am an agricultural economist. And I do remember that when I was at the uh, university, the green revolution was, uh, well, was around and, you know, and uh, the saying, the main saying of the, of, the, of the Green Revolution, which came from the developed world, was we, uh, we apply the, the, the Green Revolution, we will not have hunger, and people and the, the rural people will earn more money. What was the result? We have people, more people with hunger and earning less. So that globalized knowledge was not useful. And uh, a second experience is that um, uh, what we experienced that started happening in the 80s with um, you know, what is called the neoliberal uh, uh, scheme of, of things. I mean, which meant basically the what well, we know the Washington Consensus. And after 40 years of that global knowledge that we have, we see more poor people in the world and more rich people in the world as well. So we have to be very careful. I mean, we have to be very careful in the sense that 
what we see if i if education is an instrument to make society better i mean to increase uh, the benefits for everybody for for the, for the common good some things that are produced internationally are very good instruments to achieve that and some others are not so the so the main thing is to have a strategic mind particularly from those making decisions what i mean they should do i mean for deans rectors i mean should think very carefully i'm going to send a student abroad i mean to north america europe or wherever what i should uh, advise that student to do i mean we have many problems poverty inequality uh, uh, i don't know in the amazon we are destructing the amazon so we need i mean uh, so i need to choose the place the university where he or she can learn how to preserve the amazon for instance not just to go away and learn whatever you know perhaps in, in my comment saying no let's make uh, i mean good business with the amazon that's what bolsonaro is doing and he's saying and some of his followers i mean making destroying the amazon is a good business that's what we should do so that's the only thing that i wanted to say good that uh, uh, we uh, relate universities with local needs in a globalized world let's be careful with what global knowledge offers for good and what global knowledge offers for not good ends thank you thank you can we have the third comment or question so uh, i'm sandeep mishra i'm a, a vice chancellor of nims university jaipur india uh, my question was, uh, there were two questions. One was whether the Erasmus program was for global students, which I got an answer it is. The other question is, uh, how actually can uh, students be part of this program and actually how can they access this program? So this nitty gritty of how to do it. Thank you to uh, the first two. Uh, um, speakers on the round of questions that is uh, Sonia. Uh, basically, Sonia um, shared her experience as a, an alumni of uh, Erasmus program. And what she said in terms of cultural exchange actually resonates to what uh, Marietta mentioned that you know internationalization has to be a win win situation and for our local students, I mean, in the host universities to gain international experience, it's not necessary for them to go abroad, but they can gain international experience and the cultural exchange from the students who are visiting their universities. And uh, Robertus, if I got your name correct, um, basically uh, you said we need strategic minds of those who lead universities. Uh, basically, we are talking of the vice chancellors, the rectors, the principals, um, in terms of where they send their students for international experience so they can gain meaningful and relevant experience. And you cautioned on the global knowledge uh, not necessarily being uh, good for the local uh, experience. Um, and from the vice chancellor from uh, Japan, India, you had a very simple question. Uh, you wish to know how can students be part of the Erasmus program? So those are from me and uh, I would like to welcome our presenters, any of you who wish to respond to any of those three questions. Um, there's a wireless mic you can share, you're welcome. I think you can hear me now, right? Yes, well, thank you so much. I can first start maybe replying to the question directly, and then I can offer a couple of reflections um, to what especially Roberto said. 
Um, so, well, first of all, we ourselves as a student organization, we don't manage the funds, but we are mostly an alumni organization of former participants. But I can just tell you a bit because I think it's relevant that uh, these Erasmus funds are managed mainly, I mean, they are managed by the European Commission in general, but also through national agencies in different countries. And more specifically for non-European, non-Erasmus plus institutions, uh, the way to get involved is through contacting universities that are part of the program, right? So universities that are located in one of the Erasmus plus countries, which are basically EU countries and also neighboring countries such as Norway, but also Turkey, North Macedonia, Serbia, etc. And they can have mobility agreements with the university in certain conditions, but they are, they are available. So if you have European partners, even some of them here, that's a conversation that you can have with them. And connecting a bit also with the other comment, I think it's important, especially we're talking before about the importance of national funding, governmental funding. This program that's now so famous started 35 years ago with 3,000 students. And it was the success, the push from the universities, the push from the students to make it bigger that made it it is today. It happened in the, European, in the European context, but maybe it can also happen in other continents. So I think that this is also a reflection that we can take, right? Like this transnational collaborative programs that involve the students directly that give them this positive benefit can happen all over the world. And I think it's a very positive development to think about how they can be replicated maybe in Latin America, in Asia, all over the world. So something to consider, to learn from this experience to do it as well. I think, and Roberto, right? You raised a couple of, thank you so much for that comment. I think it's very relevant. I think that it's important not to be afraid to expose students to the unknown, right? But I agree with you what, what is fundamental when we plan internationalization activities is to think about what are the expected learning outcomes, academic and non-academic, meaning I think that sometimes for universities in the Global South, it can also be very good to send students to the Global North to also see the things that your students don't see on TV, right? When you send a student to the US to also see inequality, to see social challenges, from the point of view to understand like that not everything is as we presented it many times, right? And to reflect on what are the similarities, the differences. So I believe we should never try to protect students from the unknown, but we should work with them to think about learning outcomes and then possible changes and possible reflections on what we can bring home to achieve a positive impact. Uh, so just wanted to share the, the, those, those two comments. And then also just final thing. I believe that it is quite clear sometimes, you know, when, whenever we try to advocate in the European context for more global cooperation, comments um, like the one from Susan, yes, yes, Susan, really show that this is probably it, the best investment that we can do, right? Invest in international cooperation that involves the students that create those connections is the best way to create a global conversation that involves students directly. So I really hope that the discussion on funding continues and that authorities see that, especially in the current global context, it's super important to continue investing. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Welcome, Marit. Thank you, for, thank you for your questions, everyone, and comments. Uh, the interest is so important. I too wanted to respond to the Secretary General's very thoughtful statements. And I think you are right. There is no such thing as an absolute knowledge that applies absolutely equally in every situation, with the exception perhaps of certain mathematical proofs. Uh, but even those, the way they land in different environments is different. I think what is, I hope this, as a child of international education and now purveyor of it, I do hope that knowledge seeking is shared among all human beings. And where that is held back and repressed, we get into trouble in our societies. And so uh, that's where your point about exposure comes in. And to add a further layer, I think, to what you have said is, I think what I'm hearing you say, it's not just that you just don't want to replant a certain imperial model of knowledge all over the world. That would be the last thing I'd want to be doing uh, with our university. I think um, uh, finding, going into communities and learning what kinds of knowledge apply in those communities and valuing that knowledge as knowledge, even if it hasn't historically been valued in the academy, 
as counting as knowledge. That is a really difficult thing to do, and but that is what you hear a call for in all those student communities. I know the ones in South Africa particularly well, in Puerto Rico, where I've worked just in other conditions for the Mellon Foundation, where, and even within America in, in subaltern communities where the call is really for letting the knowledge that comes out of those communities be recognized as valid in the academy and productive. And then exposing people in privileged institutions or, or in historically white institutions, you could even say, to learn from those experiences. And I think that is why what several of us on the panel have really emphasized, the, the connection between global exposure and community-based learning, finding the global, finding the global in the local or going to the global in the local, and especially going to the local in the global, where that has become so important, because that is where in, in our knowledge communities or learning communities, which is what universities after all are, where new forms of knowledge can emerge and be recognized as knowledge. So I think that your comment really resonated with me. Thank you, Marietta. Peter, you want to say something? Yes, please. I think the intervention of the Secretary General invites us to um, think about the difference between individual purpose and institutional sake of internationalization. Um, that's very important, I think. Uh, from the individual side, uh, there is no doubt there are different interests, uh, learning about the unknown, but also um, exploring potential labor markets. I find it very, find it very intriguing that such a high ratio of students identified as a priority for their stay abroad that they would like to test the, the respective local labor market. Um, and there is an institutional interest. And I think this institutional interest is to a certain extent um, a more or less purpose-related, outcome-related interest. Um, and I think what really is important is that institutions of higher education try to find a good balance between internationalization at home and sending their students abroad. And I'm always um, a little bit suspicious when this balance is missing in an institution or in, in, in a national range of uh, internationalization activities. And um, in Germany, we, we very much look for, for this balance. I think this is important because also the DNA of an institution needs this harmony. The same counts for the individual. The individual must go abroad, must also root it locally. And this also counts for institutions, I think. And if you really want to have a good global network, um, giving and receiving, well, then we need this balance. And for this sake, I think it's important to have more such programs at the Erasmus Plus. Um, in Europe, we have the European University Alliances, and I would very much be in favor of extending such a model to a globalized perspective, because this is very helpful to have this exchange of both students and staff uh, not only to focus on education but on research projects and to have this in many many spots of the global so i think this could be a kind kind of blueprint also for global activities thank you peter and uh, thanks to all our presenters for reacting to what came from the floor now time is really not on our side but we're going to try and take three more uh, comments or questions i see one hand there Hi, um, Sophia from the Association of Commonwealth Universities. I wanted to raise a point that um, a graph that Edwin showed uh, made me think about uh, was the one where you showed how many students were considering staying abroad for a career when they actually go on international mobility pro uh, programs. And here, you know, we're t discussing international mobility as uh, globalized and um, a desired outcome for a lot of countries, but when it comes to the local needs, are we discussing the local needs as the country where they go and stay, or as a country that they may just be immigrating from? And especially considering the access to international mobility programs, sometimes we can be actually um, draining talent from a lot of countries that are not as attractive to stay when students go to those countries um, for their mobility programs. 
And I just wanted to know what's the panel's views on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any or? Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm from Ethiopia, Bahad University. Uh, I, I, I think your name? Uh, from Bahad University, Ethiopia. But, but your name? Uh, Freo, Freo Tagenya Monye. Uh, very difficult probably to capture. Uh, my, my, I, I was struggling with myself if I have to ask, but uh, whenever I'm moving from conference to conference, I hear this contextualization of education. For example, some people talk about Africanization of education or Ethiopianization of education. And we also hear about this global knowledge, working together, cooperation, and so on and so on. And I also went, there was a very nice presentation by the vice chancellor that uh, New York University in Abu Dhabi if I ask why they moved to Abu Dhabi, then I may suspect that there is something like business or whatever. And I have been asking some European partners if they can have like a satellite campus in Ethiopia, they may tell you that we have opened in China or in Abu Dhabi. So it is, I, I, I feel that there is this, and yesterday there was this about, uh, I mean, a presentation by this epistemology of knowledge. So what is really driving us when we talk about globalization? Is it a real spirit of collaboration, cooperation, or do we have like this motive of business, which like uh, a person from Latin America was mentioning about the green revolution, which was really scientifically highly promoted, but we also know the results while positive and negative. So what, what is really the real motive behind globalization? Thank you. Thank you from Ethiopia. Can we have the last one or, oh, yeah, please. I think uh, beyond presentations. Sorry, uh, uh, I know who we are, please. I, I'm Professor Anbir Singh. Uh, Pro Chancellor uh, from uh, National University of Delhi. Uh, I think uh, this is a wonderful program. And beyond the presentations which you have made and uh, the other thing, things which you are talking uh, or the some uh, way which uh, we are not sure what we, we, we want to uh, accredit this program. To my mind, uh, the best part of the program is that it, it takes us to the unknown. We move to a place where we are not aware of it and we get to know a lot of things about a particular uh, country or system where we go. And to me, the program is useful because it nurtures a lot of values in a student. Like it will give you confidence and you share best practices. You already know your country, but when you move to other country, you know a lot of things about their country, about their culture, about their language, about their food habits. I, I know from myself, I was not in this program, but I was a culture exchange student uh, in Moscow and Kiev, long back, it's a, it's a long back. And the amount of information and the amount of knowledge I gathered about uh, USSR at that time, it disintegrated later on, it was phenomenal. I think beyond uh, whatever program we have, it gives a lot of uh, other values to the students, which are very, very central, very, very important. And uh, probably when the, we make a presentations, uh, we should focus on the values it nurtures in a student uh, would be really wonderful. Thank you. Um... Uh, again, we had uh, three questions and comments from uh, uh, the floor. Sophia um, had a question, basically wishing to know, um, when you talk of the local needs, do we mean the local in the context of 
of the host communities or the local needs in the context of countries where the students are coming from. If I got you right. And then um, from um, Ethiopia, we had a question. What's the motive behind the globalization? Is it business or what is it? And then the third one from the vice chancellor from one of the universities in Delhi, uh, he underscores the importance of the program. Uh, he said, we are moving from unknown to the known where a lot of uh, things can be learned, including language and culture. So let us, let me invite our presenters, uh, any of you who feels uh, like sharing uh, or reacting to any of these uh, raised questions and comments. You're welcome. Thank you very much for these um, important questions and remarks. Um, so, sorry, I forgot your name, but from the Association of Commonwealth Universities. Uh, Sophia. Sophia, thank you for your question. So in terms of my presentation, I think the, you know, uniting and aligning the global needs with the local needs counts just as much from universities that might be traditional destination institutions as it counts from uh, source, source markets or source countries uh, more traditionally, I think that plays for both. Um, but obviously there is not a symmetric uh, mobility of students and particularly not in uh, full degree mob mobile students. And I think brain drain is a, is a real issue. And um, unfortunately, I don't have an encompassing answer to that issue. Um, we believe in, as an organization, we believe in academic freedom we believe in the power of discussion and bringing perspectives together, not meaning that one of those perspectives is the right one. And we also believe in the freedom of movement of academics, but also of students. And I do think that not all countries are equally benefiting from that. Now, there are luck luckily also quite some examples where, let's say, traditional sending countries of talent are benefiting from that fact whether that's students that are coming. India is a great example of that, where a big industry is being built by students that have typically studied in the States, worked in the States for mid-career, and then came back to build up, for instance, IT consulting industry in the Bangalore area and so on. Also, there's uh, remittance and, and students coming back. But there are some, I think, potentially positive benefits, or at least positive examples. But if the sun is... I don't think the sum is equal for, our, for all countries, unfortunately. In my mind still, that doesn't mean we should stop it. I think we should still go for freedom of movement of the individual. Because this allows, and this, this links a little bit to the globalization question, well, this allows talent to go to the area in the world where there is, they are the most needed or where they can be the most impactful or where they can build the best career or life for them in the future, which ultimately in total, the whole world should be benefiting from. Again, probably not all equally. And that's the hard thing about making sure that the business impact, but I think also the efficiency impact, the ideally also peace and tolerance and uh, more equal opportunity, um, that is benefiting to the world at large. But again, how do we make sure that everybody benefits to the same extent or to a similar extent? I think that's a super hard thing to do. Um, if I would have the answer, I would uh, try to create one uh, state uh, for the world and become the president. Um, but I think it's a very important thing to always keep in mind and strive towards things on how we can make sure that everyone in the ecosystem is benefiting um, and, um, and then we can support and accelerate those movements as much as possible because I think we've seen and some, some examples were mentioned today where 
what happens if not everybody back benefits it goes well for those can go well for a while but then at some point there's going to become crisis and obstruction um, so it's it's critical to to find ways to distribute the benefits um, of, of all of the things we're discussing whether it's globalization or student exchange or talent mobility uh, and, uh, and and research collaboration etc unfortunately no silver bullet uh, for me but uh, maybe uh, well, without a doubt, my, the, my, my fellow panelists will have the silver bullet. I nominate Edwin for president of the world. I think you have a wonderful vision. I wanted to address, because I did hear your question as a rather direct one, uh, at the model that I laid out, which is really very sui generis. It really is very specific to NYU. And I would want to say that because I've been part of that history of NYU's development of a global model of education from 2000, since 2002. I was gone for nine years from 2010 to 2019, but I was there at the founding of NU Abu Dhabi. And before then, we were looking very carefully at what we could do first by supporting more traditional study abroad circulatory models of the kind that Juan and Edwin uh, and Peter have also spoken about. And let me say before I just very briefly indicate how that came to pass and why we went the way we did. Uh, I would say that we studied extremely carefully what everybody else was doing. And I can honestly give the advice to anyone in this room who's dreaming that this could be a really great financial solution for your institution, forget about it. If your motivation is not to enhance your educational offer and to be to live out a fuller life for your university as a university that supports the interests of students, especially of young people seeking opportunity to develop themselves and of professors to do great research and, and, and execute on their educational uh, mission, you shouldn't be in it. Um, and therefore, you can see that quite a few of these starry-eyed uh, early globalization campuses that sprung up here and there, you can go and count how many of them have closed or haven't really fully been realized or have shrunk in their ambition from being comprehensive the way we are in Abu Dhabi and Shanghai to being something very small. You have to go in very open-eyed. This is what we recognized. It's a long story. I won't go into the whole thing of it, but I'd love to talk to anyone about it. What our president at the time, John Sexton, an ultimate educator, if ever there was one, a true teacher, what we noticed in the 2000s at NYU, which is in such a global city, of course, and our students were already so international, they wanted more of it. They wanted to go where the world was going. They wanted to go to Asia. They wanted to go to Africa. They wanted to go to Latin America. They wanted to stretch themselves and build on their New York experience. And then we noticed something really interesting. Interesting. We had a beautiful study abroad campus, still do, in Florence. 400 students a semester learning all sorts of things, not just art history or partying in Florence, really serious studies in collaboration with local universities and, and institutions. We noticed that Italian students, local students from Tuscany and beyond, Umbria, Rome, they were beginning to apply and they said, can we study here for a year and then we learn English better in Florence? Can you imagine? And then can we transfer to NYU in New York? And at first, of course, we all said, no, that's not what this is about. This is for New York-based students to go to Florence and so on. But we found that this was actually a really good way to get our students connected with peers in Florence. And we created initially, before we did anything else, an opportunity for Italian students to transfer, if they did well, to New York. And from that came the idea that we could do more than that and perhaps we developed degree granting um, campuses in areas that we didn't already know. We were humble, we had no presence in the Arab world or in the majority Muslim world. And that felt in 2006 like a real gap to these other values you speak about. If you're in downtown New York and this horrible aftermath of 9-11 has led to all sorts of closings of borders and openness, we wanted to go where our students wanted to go. And that's really how we got there. And the government of Abu Dhabi on the other hand said, you know, we have local universities, but 
it's going to take us 100 years to build a really great international university flagship from the ground up. Let's see who will help us do that. And NYU, because it is relatively non-denominational and sort of very urban and international, we raised our hands and said, yes, we will grant a degree in your country. We think we can do that. And other universities had said to this very same government, we'll come run a program for you and you'll pay for all of it. And then maybe in 10 years, we'll see if we grant you a degree. That's not a very equitable way in which to engage with the world. And so I would say that going into an enterprise like that, you need to be very open-eyed and willing to bring your whole best of your university there. And I think that's what we've tried to do. Can I? Yes. Yes, to respond to your question. I, I mean, for us, it's actually, we're lucky. We're in a good position to answer that question because of how we work. Because we are an association working mainly under two pillars, let's say. The first one is exchange, which means students go and naturally come back. And then also we're an alumni organization that is basically funded under the idea of giving back to your own community once that you come back and then building, let's say, bringing internationalization to your own community after you have gone abroad. So the whole principle, basically, you go somewhere, you learn new things, and then you bring to your community those things. You try to promote it as an international destination. You try to bring new people. And when in my presentation, I spoke about the importance of networks and how, you know, like those networks can create spaces that otherwise wouldn't exist. In our case, we are present from Madeira in Portugal to Armenia, Azerbaijan. We are about to accept our first Middle Eastern member from Jordan. And what we provide is a space in which a Jordanian university, an Azerbaijan university, Armenian, Ukrainian can have a promotion of their own country as a study destination, can engage with their peers, talk about whatever they have in common. So you have those spaces that otherwise do not really exist, right? They exist in the academic world many times, but they're not so common for so many students, maybe for the leadership of some student organizations, but we try to have spaces in which they all can interact. So then, you know, you can actually counter it. Of course, as I have, as we say, there's no magic bullet. You cannot just solve this problem. There always be countries that are more attractive for students. I think that should lead to two things. The first one is sense of responsibility, which is in the end about equity, right? This is why capacity building is important. This is why these initiatives should focus on, you know, making our places more attractive for internationalization on awakening the curiosity, for instance, in the case of students in the global north for other types of study destinations. Because, you know, like, I don't believe that, that the idea that maybe we used to have about excellence should be the only parameter to choose a study destination. I don't believe that's right. So working on those things, it's, um, it's a part of it. And then at the other, you know, on the other hand, maybe encouraging a bit those institutions or, or in those governments to make their education systems more attractive to more students, right? Because I believe that there is also that individual responsibility of trying to make your systems more attractive. So it's gonna take a while, but I believe there are already encouraging signs. We're seeing many of them here, right? Of how this competition can also bring good things if it's accompanied by these clear support measures and responsibilities from those, like in the case, you know, like maybe the European Union with capacity building initiatives can help the most. So I hope that that answers a bit. Just to add briefly on the question, what are the driving forces behind globalization? I think um, from the institutional side, um, there is a lot of uh, purpose-related thinking in it, uh, even though there is uh, also um, the perspective to bring people together. I think uh, it's much about branding, it's much about also financial interests, about competition. Um, but far beyond this, uh, I should think we should take into account that science diplomacy has been playing a key role also in this field, because when we um, started this uh, intensified process of globalization 25 years from now, we were optimistically driven by the idea that we could bridge gaps, that we could uh, bring together different cultures, and that we could also um, show the relevance of academic autonomy and independence. And um, nowadays, we are discussing this again more critically, reluctantly, with respect to uh, the outcomes 
I think the concept is without no alternatives, but we must modify it. We cannot pursue uh, on a naive level, so we must correct some um, premises we had. But in the end, I think uh, one strong argument still is that uh, academic world's interaction can reveal um, the major importance of uh, issues and values like liberty and academic freedom. And that's the major reason why we should go on here without um, being naive, definitely. We cannot be, in, particularly in Europe. We have le learned this in Eastern Europe and our experiences with Russia. I had uh, headed a university um, which had a lot of joint study programs with Moscow, with Petersburg, and I was very optimistic uh, that we could um, froze the eyes, but freeze the eyes, but in the end, uh, the contradiction was true. But beyond that, I think uh, the issue of academic um, diplomacy should be still a very important motive for us. Thank you for the reactions uh, from questions from the audience and comments. Um, I believe all of us here concur with the fact that universities are strategically positioned to contribute to solving global problems. Um, as it was mentioned by our presenters, uh, because of basically their core functions, research, uh, teaching, because universities are vested with the responsibility to develop minds, you know, and talents. And, and, and therefore, uh, we are strategically positioned. But again, as it has been mentioned, there are things and challenges to be mindful of, but definitely, um, we should know that we are strategically positioned and you know the community depends on us universities um with that i once again wish to thank the organizers for having thought of this very topical topic um and i would like to thank the presenters for their very insightful presentations and for responding to your questions and comments and i wish to thank the audience for having shown interest in this session and for having stayed on until now and we have eaten up your five minutes for the networking break but you have been patient and as a chair i thank you all and i declare the session closed thank you very much Thank you.